Amen. All right. I'm Pastor Trevor. Good to welcome me. Thank you tonight for coming. It's St. Patrick's Day, as you know. And as you know, um, St. Patrick's Day is celebrated. We were on the strip this afternoon, and it's amazing to see a green up there. And I do what I often do on St. Patrick's Day, and I go and ask people, can they tell me one single thing about St. Patrick? Right? And even though they're dressed up like St. Patrick and celebrating St. Patrick's Day, hardly anybody can tell you one single thing about St. Patrick. And maybe you can't either. So, here's the deal. Uh, I come from Northern Ireland, right? Now, and when we go all over the world, people say, oh, you're from Ireland. Right? Now, Northern Ireland and Republic of Ireland are two countries. Did you know that? No, they're the same country. Steve, don't same. keep interrupting me, my friend, okay? So, the same, so it's the same island, but two different countries, right? Um, two different governments, two different currencies. One of them is in Europe, one of them is out of Europe. And we have, because we're born in Ireland, two passports. Ooh. How cool is that? <laughs> A British passport and an Irish passport. So we can be both in Europe and out of Europe when it suits us. Ireland is a very complicated place, as you know. And St. Patrick's Day is a very complicated thing because it's celebrated all over the world, but it's hardly celebrated in Ireland. Did you know, for example, that in Ireland, some people get St. Patrick's Day off as a holiday. Some people don't get St. Patrick's Day off as a holiday. And some people get a half a day off at a holiday as a kind of cup ride. It's very weird. I don't really understand it all. But this man, St. Patrick, gives this day its name. And that's what we're here tonight to learn a little bit more about that. We're going to sing some songs. We're going to have a little quiz. And then I'm going to teach a little bit about, um, about St. Patrick. Okay, so thank you very much for, for coming. What I want you to do is to watch a couple of little videos. The first one is just a little video about the island of Ireland, okay? You'll love it when you see it. And the second one is a little video about who was St. Patrick. So other people are just coming to join us, so we'll just uh, let them come in, let them get settled, and then we'll watch the, we'll watch the video, okay? So, uh, gracias, Ruth. <laughs> I kind of like that video, but there's a big, big mistake in it. Um, right at the very start, I don't know if you, if you noticed, you probably didn't, but it said it was born in the year 35 AD. And it also said it was born. He died in the year 400. I'm going to come to that, Steve. Okay, don't keep interrupting me, my friend, all right? That's it. I'm a sinner like yourself. Exactly. So we started in 35 AD. That's what it said he was born, 35 AD. So he died in 461 AD. Let's make him 426, right? That's not right. He wasn't born in 35 AD. So I'm not sure why they made that mistake, but I kind of like that video. Are you ready to sing a little bit? We'll sing a few songs, all right? We'll sing a few Irish songs together. And uh, Sharon and Richard are going to lead us, and my friend Graham's on the guitar here tonight, so that's good. So I hope you're in good voice, and you're ready to sing. There's a few songs here we're going to sing. So the first one is... Uh, this one, I'll tell me, Mom, when I get home. Well, not play this too fast because it gets a little bit. It's a lot of. All right, we'll play it fast. Okay. So, uh, if you, uh, keep your seats. I'm going to sing this song. Right, so this is a song from Belfast, Northern Ireland. And I'll tell me, Mom means I'll tell my mother. Right. So, can you all say after me? I'll tell me, Mom. Uh, I'll tell me, Mom, when I get home. The boys will leave the girls alone. Right. Let's try this. Okay, go.
out and put a, a, a Florida tab on it. Okay. See how you do with this one. All right. This is we go down from Belfast, which is in the north, the Dublin, which is in the south. And this is the Dublin's first city. You heard this song? Put your hand up. You heard this song? No? Yeah? All right. Where the girls are so pretty. Now, this is about a, like a, a lady called Molly Malone. And if you go to Dublin and you go to Grafton Street, there's a statue thingy there of Molly Malone with her weed barrel, okay? She was a barrel lady. She sold stuff in Dublin. So it goes like this. Percy French wrote this song. You go to Newcastle, you go to the Percy French restaurant, 
Percy French bar, Percy French everything. He wrote this song. All right, so let's sing this. Oh, Mary, this London is a wonderful sight. Go. Oscar, you, you, you 
not learn when they got any chocolate yet, no? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, we're back on this side, right? Okay, that's
That will be good. Their names are Graham and Claire uh, Bannister. There's a there's a got a microphone there, guys. Yeah, that you can use. And um, I've known these 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 folks up for for some time, and they 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 come from Ireland, obviously. Uh, uh, my hometown is Belfast, Northern Ireland. That's their hometown as well. So I've known them. They're some friends of ours. So uh, first time in Benidorm. It's not right. Just arrived yesterday. What do you think of Benidorm, Graham? It's certainly individual. Right. It's very different from any other. Um, seaside or holiday uh, destination that I've ever been to. I was amazed at the discovery yesterday that the sand on the beach isn't from Spain. No. It was brought in from Africa. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's, a it's a lovely place. It's a lovely looking place and the sunshine is obviously there as well. So I like it. I've only been here. And what about you, time. Claire? What's your first impressions of Benidorm? First impressions, it was lovely arriving, leaving the rain in Belfast yesterday and arriving to the sun. Um, to be honest, I love looking this way. Looking that way is not my comfort zone. Okay. So let me, uh, okay. um, let me ask you this. Um, you come from, from Ireland. Um, have you ever seen a leprechaun? No. Graham? I have. Okay. Oh, not recently. Not recently. Okay. Um, have you ever? Um, do you know what a shillelagh is? Yes. I thought, thinking back to my childhood, it was a like a souvenir mm, mallet hammer type wooden thing that you know had a, a thing that you would hit people <laughs> with as a souvenir. People would have bought those. I'm not sure if that's. Have you ever seen a shillelagh? I've seen a shillelagh. It's like a nowadays it's like a walking stick, isn't it? It's made out of um, out of wood. There's like a a metal handle on the top. I think it was once a weapon. It might have been a long time ago. Another question is: Have you ever drunk pachi? Yes. No. No. What is pachi? Well, the best way to describe pachi is like Irish moonshine. Yes. It's like, well, 70 80 percent alcohol at least, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, made from potato, made from potato, or made from, yeah. potato or made from wheat. Yeah, that's what's for that's it's for made made from potato. Yeah, made from yeah. 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 Okay, and, and we'll talk, Steve. We'll talk, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I would be a no on that one as well. Okay, um, you a couple of days ago you celebrated your wedding anniversary. How many days? And part of coming to bed or it's actually for a, a little bit of celebration. So how many years have you been married, Claire? 32. Can <laughs> um, you tell us, Graham, about your family, what family you have? All right. Well, well we have three, three grown up children now. Um, one of them, the youngest one, um, is married. He got married last year. The middle one, he gets married next year. No. This year, this July, this July. <laughs> <laughs> and the, our daughter, who's the eldest, there's, there's nobody even on the scene, but okay. she has her own home. Uh, the three of them are living with us any longer. Oh, tell, just tell the folks here, also the folks on YouTube, how, how we know each other. How do we know each other? Through Newton Breda Church. We um, left our previous church and came to Newton Breda about seven years. Eight years, ago. Eight years ago, and were welcomed in uh, by Pastor Trevor and Maggie at that time. Okay, and so obviously you're Christians because you know we're here in the English church and we've had a little bit of fun, but we just want to talk a little bit more seriously now about some important stuff. So, um, as Christians, and that's important in your marriage, but tell tell us, Claire, how you became a Christian because the Bible says you're not born a Christian, yeah. right? How did you become a Christian? What what was the moment in your life? Yeah, I can clear up a wee bit of misunderstanding. To be honest, I was always good in my eyes. Um, I didn't drink potching. Um, I didn't swear. I would not have been comfortable in the activities in the strip. So I thought I was a Christian. Our neighbors moved in next door and they went to church on Sunday morning back, Sunday for Sunday school back, Sunday evening and back. And it was at that time that my granny, who was a godly woman, gave me a Bible. And in the front cover of it, there was the verse in scripted Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6, which I'm sure most of you know, it's trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not on your own understanding, um, and he shall direct thy paths. I think I might have missed a wee bit in there. In all your ways. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. And when I read that, I didn't 
the bit that sort of troubled me were, was, well, if I'm a Christian, why am I not going to church? So it was my neighbor I asked to take me to church and uh, there I heard the gospel um, that I was not good. I might have been good in my eyes, but I was not good in God's eyes. And it was only through the sacrifice of his son and accepting <coughs> him into my life that that gave me the goodness or the righteousness that made me a Christian. Great so that was when I was 14. Okay, and for you, Graham, what was the story? Well, my, my upbringing was driver in church, so I went to Saturday Brethren Church, for those of you who know what that is, so it was quite quite strict. And uh, my parents went there, myself and my brother, my aunt and uncle and the old family all, all attended the same, the same Brethren Church. And like Claire, for a long, long time, I went to church. My family are a good family, I'm a good person, so I must be a Christian as well. Yeah. And then the pastor who was preaching there, um, he, was, he was the resident pastor, Jack Mitchell, you called him. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was one Sunday night, and it was one of the few Sunday nights I was actually sitting and listening and not messing around with my friend beside <laughs> me. And I remember him saying something which really hit home with me, and he said, he said about God not having any grandchildren. He talked about God having children, and you had to be a child of God to be a Christian. And I sort of thought, well, my parents are a Christian because they've asked the Lord into their lives. Mm -hmm. I haven't done that. I can't be God's grandchild. So the next day, I was only 10 years old, and the next day I was on a school. I remember being half term in, in November, and I was 10 years old. And I remember then thinking, God, I need to, to ask you to be my personal savior. Sure, sure. And that's when I became a Christian. And then all the growth and all the learning has happened ever since. I'm still learning about being Christian even today. Great, because sometimes there are just these moments, aren't there, when just God just turns up and it does something, and tonight could be that moment for somebody here. But you've been married 32 years. Would you just like to tell us a little bit about your marriage and how God has been good to you in different ways? Yeah, but God has really looked after us. Um, we've discovered, I would say, we discovered God in our marriage, even in the last probably eight, eight years or so. Um, we were both involved in a church, quite busy in a church, which is a good thing in some ways, but sometimes the busyness, the activity can get in the way of your personal relationship with your family and with other Christians, but more importantly, with God himself. You can be busy without realizing what you're busy for. And I got into that slowly. I didn't realize it at the time, but I was getting more and more busy in church and doing things. And I was neglecting what was important, which was loving my family, loving my wife the way I should have done. I'm loving God and having that personal relationship with God. And things did change for us, and we ended up leaving church, leaving the church. We ended up living separately for a while as well, but we had a wonderful Christian counselor who was guiding us through that time. And I personally rediscovered myself in Christ at that time through his word, and particularly through books like Romans, Romans 8, uh, and books like Ephesians as well, where it talked about how God loved the church in a sacrificial way and that's what marriage was all about how the husband loved the wife in a sacrificial way and had to put her first so it's been wonderful absolutely wonderful ever since because we've been going to newton breda now we've been involved in ministry together in newton breda we lead a small group together we study together we talk together about things we never talked together about before and we are really on fire for god i would like to say that if i could but in my life it's so different from what it was 10 even 15 years ago and I thank my wife for leading me down that road as well and taking us there. You know, it really was a tough time. Um, as Graham has alluded to it, you know, we were both busy in the church, Graham more so. Um, and I, you know, I knew things weren't right in our marriage, but in one part of my brain I was going, well he's not out drinking with the lads, he's out at all the church meetings. Um, we probably were that couple in church that shocked people whenever they heard we were going through difficulties. Um, we wore a mask for a long time within the church congregation and I would say, you know, I, personally speaking I would have no one there wasn't there was something wrong would have said do you really love me and graham would have gone yes and i'm sort of thinking okay it's all my low self-esteem um i feel he doesn't 
until it came to a crux, and you know, indeed, that's what how Graham felt and what Graham said to me. So at that time, yeah, as a mummy with three kids, the youngest almost eighteen, I was devastated. Um, I was involved in a Bible study, so I was reading God's word. I believed God's word, and I, you know. I read through the Psalms because they were the easiest for me to concentrate on, the easiest for me to, to get into my head and to cling on to God's truth. And I knew God loved me. I knew God was sovereign. I knew God cared for me. And no matter what the outcome of our marriage was going to be, I knew I was God's child. So knowing that and having a real close Band of support, of prayer, people that prayed for me, that loved me, um, and just allowing time. I remember in God's word, do you know what women always like to fix things? You know, and we like to tell our husbands what they're not really understanding, or what they're not really listening to, or what they're not really doing right. Boys, a dear, I wanted to do that, and on some occasions I did, but I read very clearly in the Psalms, and it was promised to me it was wait on the Lord, you know, let him work it out. And that's what had to happen for us. Um, it was almost, it's, it's not a, it, it, you know, it was almost God was saying to me, wait, don't meddle and just let God be in control and work this situation out. And we thank God that he did. Um, and again, it was through, through prayer, time, Christian counseling, and then healing, um, you know, but, but yeah, we thank God that he did. And the, just the um, blessing that it's been to our children, that life at times is tough for everybody. Things come into our path that we don't understand. So just to go back to that very verse that my wonderful granny gave me, I love grandparents, you know, trust in the Lord, with all your heart, lean not onto your own understanding. I remember crying out to God and going, why? I don't understand what's happening, but I trusted God and he worked things out. So, yeah. Well, I just, want to, I, I just want to thank you both for being so honest and to say that if anyone here wants to chat to Graham and Claire over the food afterwards, I'm sure you'll be happy to, to come and, and, and chat to them. But they've been real honest with us, haven't they? And that's always a good thing in church. So I want you to thank them uh, on my behalf. First of all, for uh, coming to Benidorm and then uh, blessing us with your music and then also blessing us with your, uh, with your story right there. Uh, we're going to have some food shortly and there's some um, Irish stew for you, some crusty bread and a little bit of dessert. And i um, really grateful to those who have prepared that but wouldn't it be good just to spend a little bit of time thinking about who this man Patrick is and if you can give me your attention for 20 minutes or so uh, we'll run through some stuff about Patrick that you may not know and some of you may have heard this before and this might just refresh your your memory it's St. Patrick's Day 17th of March and all across the world today whether it's Australia or America or even in Hong Kong there are people celebrating St. Patrick's Day, which is amazing. Um, and of course, many people, as I've already said, don't know a, a, a blessed thing about the man whose day they're celebrating um, and know nothing about him. So I want to share with you three things that uh, definitely is wrong about St. Patrick. Three myths. The first myth is this. Um, some people think he was an American, right? He was not an American. My dear old dad died um, a number of years ago. And just a few years before he died, I said to Dad, what, what do you know about St. Patrick? And my dad said, I think he was a Yankee. <laughs> uh, he had grown up believing uh, that Patrick was an American. He wasn't, okay. Uh, the Americans claim everything, don't they? And on St. Patrick's Day, they even turned the water there outside the White House um, uh, green. And um, the second thing about him was he did not remove the snakes from Ireland, okay? That's probably the only thing people think they know about St. Patrick. We've never had snakes in Ireland, um, so he didn't remove them. Um, as you saw on the little video earlier, sometimes it's because he drove paganism out of Ireland and 
became a myth that he drove snakes out of Ireland. The third thing that's not true about St. Patrick is this. He did not use the shamrock to teach the Trinity. You see, some people say that the shamrock has got three leaves, and the three leaves remind us of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and that uh, they're three or one, and they're one and three, and Patrick, being, uh, being in Ireland, took the shamrock to teach people about the Trinity. That's not true. That never happened, uh, as far as we know. So let me tell you a few things about it. So St. Patrick was born about 390 <coughs> AD, probably in Wales, right, on the west coast of Britain, so he was Welsh, we think. He grew up in a very wealthy home. As you can see, his father was a man called Calpurnius, who was a Christian, a deacon of the church. And so Patrick, uh, his name wasn't Patrick then, but he grew up in this kind of Christian environment, a bit like Claire and, uh, and Graham were sharing with us a little bit. But Patrick himself was not a Christian. Something terrible happened to him at 16. Because the mad Irish came across the water and, uh, and they seized him. They, they stormed into Calpurnius' house and they took Patrick, who was only 16 years of age, and they, they took him away to his, to back to Ireland, really. Uh, a terrible thing when you think about it. Just 16, you know, ripped away from your family uh, in, in the hands of these mad Irish marauders whose language he didn't even understand because they probably spoke a Gaelic, and he was brought to Ireland, and he says later that he was brought to the point of collapse. I'm not surprised. But in that moment, God used that very difficult moment in his life in two ways. First of all, during that time, Patrick became a real Christian. He became a follower of Jesus. Now, to be a Christian is not to be brought up in a Christian home. Or just to ascend a certain number of ideas. To be a Christian is to repent, to believe, and to fall in love with Jesus. And that's what happened to Patrick. And then also, obviously, he was prepared by God for his life's work. Now, Patrick was sold to a sheep farmer. And he was on, the, um, on a mountain, in, in, uh, in a mountain that we call Slemish Mountain. And the sheep farmer made, made Patrick sleep on the mountain, live on the mountain, had very little food, it was freezing cold, it was raining all the time, it was horrible, horrible conditions. But it was in those conditions that Patrick got converted. Amazing, isn't it? And this is what he wrote later. I didn't know the true God, but lay in death and unbelief. So even though he was brought up in a Christian environment, he didn't know God, right? So that's important. And then he said this, the Lord opened the understanding of my unbelieving heart that I might recall my sins and turn with all my heart to the Lord my God. That's what happened to him. He was just a young man. We think he was probably uh, about 20, 21 at that stage. He was in, in captivity for six years. And during his, after he got converted, he started to pray. For the first time in his life, he started to pray. Often when people come to Jesus and they get converted, that's the first time in their lives they really start to pray. And that's what happened to him. And this is what he wrote. The love of God and the fear of him have grown in me. And up to this day, by the favor of God, I have kept the faith. So there he is as a young man, 21 years of age or so. Uh, terrible life on a mountain, no cover, no shelter, very little food, in slavery to the sheep farmer, living amongst the sheep with all that that means. Uh, but now he's a Christian. And that what happened was that he escaped. He was 22, six years in captivity. And he managed to escape. And I want you to imagine this, how he traveled for 200 miles. No car, no bus, no train, no tram. Just walking, right? Not really knowing where he was going. It's a foreign country. It's a foreign land. He's got no sat-nav. He's got no smartphone. He's got no maps. He's just walking. He's trying to escape. 200 miles in the cold and the wet and the rain. Miserable, right? No food. Just sleeping where he could getting whatever food he could, no proper clothing, 200 miles, until he eventually got to the coast and he managed to make his way back, would you believe, 
to his birth country, 22 years of age. But he's now a different person because he's a Christian. And back in his birth country, he lived there for 18 years. Um, and he learned the gospel more and more. He learned more and more what it was to be a Christian. He joined a monastery and they, he was taught the scriptures. He was taught the Bible. He was taught the ways of God. And then he got a vision. He saw a man called Victorious one night. And this Victorious was basically saying to him, Holy youth, come and walk among us. And he wondered what this meant. He thought, I don't know what this means really. And then he realized that he was being called to go back to Ireland. I don't know if you'd want to go back to a country that had treated you so horribly and so badly. I think if it was me, I'd want to escape forever. But he wanted to go back. Okay, he got this vision, this call called the cry of the Irish. It was ringing in his ears. He couldn't do anything but obey it. He's now 40 years of age. The year is about 430 AD. 40 years of age. Been a Christian now roughly 20 years. And he now goes back to this country which treated him so badly. And for the next 30 years or so, he traveled near and far, up and down the land, preaching, teaching the Irish, the pagans, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He wasn't teaching them religion. He wasn't asking them to become Catholic or Protestant. He was teaching them about Christ and what Christ had done for him. And he had this holy compassion for Irish people. And this is what he wrote. It was not my doing, this holy compassion, that I have towards that nation which once took me captive and dealt havoc among the men and women servants of my father's house. It was not my doing. Where did this come from? This desire came from the Holy Spirit, from God himself. And he died on the 17th of March, 461 AD. He's 71 years of age. So 30 years of his life, the last 30 years he spent amongst the people of Ireland. That's why 17th of March is, guess what? St. Patrick's Day, because it's the day on which he died. And he is buried in the grounds of a cathedral called Down Cathedral. It's in Down Patrick in County Down. Um, and today many people will have gone there and that you can see Patrick's grave. And this is a sort of photograph of Patrick's grave and the little stone with a little plaque on it. The reference to who he is. And they would have had some little Christian service there today to remember this man, Patrick. So as I wrap this up, I just want to I want to say to you that Patrick only left two things. One was a letter that he wrote. He wrote this letter to a, 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 a terrible man in Britain who was attacking Christians in Britain, persecuting Christians and killing Christians. Patrick took it upon himself to write him a letter to warn him of the dangers that he was in. And that letter we still have, right? And in the letter he wrote this, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul. Who's he quoting? Jesus, right? And Patrick's reminding this terrible ruler that he could be a ruler, he could be a, a millionaire, he could have everything the world has to offer, but if he loses his soul, it's not a very good deed. And Patrick would say the same to us today. What would it profit you if you gained the whole world and lost your soul? That's a bad bargain. And the other thing that Patrick left behind us was what he called his confession. <clears throat> if you like, it's his statement. It's his testimony. Uh, you could actually go, go to Amazon and, and buy a copy of it. Um, I don't think um, Patrick typed it out on his <laughs> iPad, right? <laughs> um, but you can actually buy a copy of it. And do you know what the first four words of Patrick's testimony are? These words. I, Patrick sinner. Isn't that amazing? Patrick starts his confession by acknowledging that he is a sinner. And you can read that confession and it's full of very interesting, powerful stuff. But if you never get past the first four words, that's important. Because I'm going to say, I, Trevor, I'm a sinner. 
You are a sinner. We're all sin. The Bible says we've all fallen short of the glory of God. You know, I often ask the question, we were talking to people today, actually, and we were asking this question, are you a good person or a bad person? What do most people say? I'm quite a good person. That's what the Bible says. You're not quite a good person. There's none that does good, no, not one. You're selfish, you're egotistical, you're narcissistic, you're impatient, you're irritable, you're full of lust, you're full of greed, you're full of ambition and pride. You need a saviour. And Patrick knew that. He started off like this, I, Patrick, a sinner. So what was his message as a finish? Well, Patrick was steeped in the Bible. In those two documents, his letter and his confession, there are over 100 quotations from the Holy Bible, from the Scriptures. So he was steeped in the Bible. He spent all those years from he got converted, 50 years or so, reading the Bible, studying the Bible, thinking about the Bible. And he didn't have all the advantages that we have, right? We have the Bible on our phones. We have the Bible on our iPads. We can listen to the Bible while we're cooking. We can listen to the Bible while we're driving. We can listen, read the Bible in lots of different formats, translations. He was steeped in the Bible. Secondly, Patrick talked about the fact that there's going to be a judgment coming. And the Bible talks about the fact that there's going to be a judgment coming. Here, here are his exact words. I would dread exceedingly with fear and trembling. This sentence on that day when no one will be able to escape or hide, but we all, without exception, shall have to give account, even of our smallest sins, before the judgment seat of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not nice to talk about judgment, but unless you know that you're heading towards judgment, you don't know that you need rescue. Isn't that right? Unless you know that you're in trouble, you don't know that you need a deliverer. <coughs> Patrick taught that. Thirdly, fourthly, and fifthly, Patrick taught that there is a life after death, and the Bible teaches that. For those who are true believers, we go to heaven. Patrick taught that salvation is in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. Not in any religion, not in any, any particular branch of Christianity, not in being confirmed or baptized or being brought up in the church. Patrick taught, and the Bible teaches, that salvation is in Jesus Christ alone. And then he also taught this, that if you're a follower of Jesus, you have an obligation to tell others. We call that evangelism, right? Patrick said that what I'm doing in telling the Irish people about Jesus is something that we all should do wherever we are. And I want to challenge those of us tonight who are Christians to be good gossipers. <laughs> Not the gossip about other people, but the gossip about Jesus. And try to make it your aim in the course of your week or month or year to talk to other people about Jesus. I don't know how many Christians are in the room tonight, but suppose there's, suppose there's 20 of us are Christians. I'm sure there's more than that, but let's, let's take that for, for the ease of the calculation, right? And if the 20 of us spoke to two people in a week about Jesus Christ, in a year, we would speak to 2,000 people about Jesus. And that's just this little crowd. That's just this little church. Can you imagine multiplying that by thousands of churches? How different that would make the world. And that's just by speaking to two people in one week about the Lord Jesus Christ. Patrick taught that. And so finally, if I could bring Patrick back from the dead, and if I could stand him right here, right now, in Benidorm, an English church, this is what he would say. For God, let's read it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John chapter 3 and verse 16. And that in about 20 odd minutes is a little summary of the life of St. Patrick. God bless you. I want you to listen to this little video on this path I gave you the angels worship.
Just today, um, I put on my Facebook page, my own personal Facebook page, and also on the church's Facebook page, St. Patrick's Breastplate. This is the prayer that St. Patrick prayed. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down and Christ when I sit down, Christ when I arise, Christ in the heart of every man who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in every eye that sees me, Christ in every ear that hears me. I arise today through a mighty strength, the invocation of the Trinity, through belief in the threeness, through confession of the oneness of the creator of creation. Amen. Amen. Let's, say, let's say the grace of one another, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and evermore. Amen. God bless you folks. Thank you for coming. Have some food. Enjoy some company before you go. God bless you.